Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Hiller. I'm the chair of the City of Topeka City Council's Social Service Grants Committee. Today is, um, I think, probably the third annual of special meetings that this committee has scheduled for um, between when the city passes its budget and when the committee starts to work on the following year to kind of focus on a particular topic to just give some background and context to the work that the city's doing in, in making the choice to uh, entertain proposals and make some social service grants. Um, so we will have, uh, still looking for our third committee, oh here she comes, good. We will call the meeting to order, briefly get our minutes from the last meeting approved and then go into the one topic of the day, which for us this time will be um, is it just you, Brett? Brett Martin from United Way sharing with us the process and the, um, all the details he can cram into an hour on, on the recent United Way process to just examine fresh what the community needs are here in Topeka. With that, I will invite my colleagues on the council to introduce themselves. This is Hannah Nager representative for District 6. And I'm Brett Kell. I am the uh, council president for District 5. Okay, thank you both. So we've got our full committee here today. We're also supported by staff, Corey Wright and Carrie Higgins from the housing division of our planning department, Kalea Paoli from you're in, actually in finance, but she's our city grant writer. Uh, Liz Toyne, who staffs the committee in case anybody didn't know who to address their phone calls to if there's anything about the meetings. Um, and our most immediate past interim city manager, Bill Cochran, good to see you. And my understanding is that Steve Wade, recently appointed as our city manager, will be here, but a little bit late. So we'll say hello and congratulate him when he gets here. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve our July minutes. Motion by Councilwoman Nager. Yes, ma'am. Second. Second by Councilman Cal. Any discussion, corrections, additions? None. With that, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. The ayes have it, and the minutes are approved. With that, um, let me uh, name and reintroduce Brett Martin from United Way for the program on community needs. Chair, committee members, thanks for the opportunity to share today. We had this conversation a few months ago related to community needs. <clears throat> Thought we would take a look at some uh, data that we have collected really over the last 11 months to uh, take a look at what the community and what the um, what research is telling us in terms of particular needs for the community. What I've also done <clears throat> just in the last couple of minutes is I've also uh, been able to break out which of our partners in the upcoming um, 2023 year fall in these categories. So we'll be able to kind of talk about that as well when we're taking a look at some priorities here. So <clears throat> I want to talk first about what this is and what this is not so that we're clear and that we've got so that I've, I've, I've been able to be clear about expectations. So this is a snapshot of data collected from the community at two points in the last 12 months, really the uh, CHNA, the Community Health Needs Assessment, and a series of uh, community stakeholder meetings that United Way of Greater Topeka and our partners held. Uh, these are responses based on a prescribed set of questions and prompts. So these weren't questions like, what are the needs in the community? These were different types of sort of specific uh, questions that were prescribed based on any number of different things. But I do think the data still is uh, very helpful for us. I think it's an opportunity to learn from our community. These are responses from community members, so individuals who are living in the community, various zip codes from various backgrounds. Uh, diverse populations for us to be able to learn uh, what their uh, perceptions are of the needs. And I think it's a conversation starter for us uh, to, to uh, take a look at. 
what this is not. This is not a complete picture uh, of what the uh, community looks like and what its particular uh, assets and needs are. Again, these are just a couple of snapshots. This is not a scientific study. Uh, this, this was not um, a survey that went through a series of uh, data scientists for uh, validity and reliability. These are two different data sets uh, that I'm sort of pulling together here. Uh, and it's not a recommendation, a series of recommendations for action. It's just for us to take a look at, again, I believe, to start a conversation. So just for us to, to, to get a sense of what we're going to take a look at and, and uh, what, what our expectations are. So I actually presented this uh, several months ago uh, to City Council and to the County Commission in terms of the Community Health Needs Assessment. Community Health Needs Assessment is carried out every three years uh, by these partners. Uh, Stormont Vale Health, the Shawnee County Health Department, and Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods, which functions as the implementation arm of what's called the Community Health Improvement Plan, or the CHIP. Um, and so back in, uh, back in the fall of last year, so almost 12 months ago, we carried out this community health needs assessment. It's done every three years. These are, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, opportunities for us to take a look at where the needs are and then the community uses this plan as a way to leverage dollars for grant asks and prioritize investment across the community. So um, it's to understand and document the current and future community health needs, take a look at those conditions that are uh, necessary to be able to reach optimal community health and what the challenges are, the barriers that are in the way. Obviously, if you're a nonprofit health system or a health department, you have to do this. We're really fortunate that our community works together between health department and hospitals. Not every community does that. And as a result, they have two different chips on two different cycles, and it can be uh, um, incredibly difficult. Not in our community. We're very grateful that the health department and uh, Stormontville Health, uh, our, non our, our nonprofit health system, work together in this way. And the purpose of this CHNA, anytime we do a, a needs assessment, is to put together a plan. Not a plan to sit on a shelf, but a plan to help inform decisions and to help start conversations like today. So uh, more than 2,500 people responded to a community perception survey. That survey was put together when I say prescribed set of questions. That's what I'm talking about for the survey here. Nearly 150 people at targeted roundtables across the community and uh, 95 attendees and 45 organizations in a virtual town hall. Again, this was fall of uh, 2021. Pretty even distribution uh, um, uh, across ages. Um, we did see an increase in participation in non-Caucasian groups, but we still have a great deal of work to do uh, in uh, our uh, Hispanic populations uh, uh, and in our African-American populations uh, uh, and uh, in uh, mixed race uh, um, groups as well. And we know that across the community. We have a lot of work to do to be able to get more people to the table. We were happy to see uh, progress, but not good enough. So obviously this was 2021, so all kinds of conversations. So you see right smack dab in the middle. We were talking about COVID uh, and what COVID unmasked in our community and what we were able to see there. What we talked about here was um, the real vaccine that we uh, happened to talk about during our town hall was prevention, 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 being able to invest in uh, opportunities for folks in our community to be able to improve conditions so that we have better health outcomes. I was just at a conference uh, earlier this week and listening to um, uh, health systems and other folks, and most of our dollars we know in healthcare are spent on people once they go to the doctor and then once they leave the doctor, but we don't invest a lot of dollars in making sure people don't go to the doctor in the first place. And so prevention, prevention, prevention is the key. And that looks like um, making sure that we have access to housing, uh, that we are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we have strong partnerships, strong employment, that we have access to education and food security. And so those areas down there that you see in the yellow banners are our um, areas of, in, uh, of uh, excuse me, uh, emphasis and priorities within our community health improvement plan. The last one that we finish up in December of this year and really the one that's coming in the next cycle as well. Substance abuse, healthy eating, 
equitable access or health equity and um, mental health. So way back in 2018, we decided that the, that the priorities would be mental health, safe access to food, substance use, and health equity. That came directly from the community in terms of what they perceived within the round tables and within the uh, survey. So that's what we did. We put together a health improvement plan around those areas, behavioral health, access to food, substance use, and health equity. Health equity is a big kind of umbrella term for us. It has to do with access. It's got some different strategies. We'll be uh, talking more uh, about that across the community once we get to the end of the chip for this year. Um, but what did it look like? So, so I just showed you what it looked like in 2018. What did it look like in 2021? So you have a chart here. The biggest opportunity uh, is on the middle column, and on the right column is the greatest area for our, of concern for our community. And interestingly enough, uh, we have a lot of these things that have been areas of emphasis for us that are still areas of emphasis uh, for us. Uh, the number one coming through, affordable health care insurance. Obviously, we know we haven't passed Medicaid expansion in this state, so as a result, that's a huge issue for uh, families and something that we continue to work on collectively. Many of us at the uh, state uh, and uh, federal levels uh, as well. Not something that we control here as the Social Services Grants Committee or City Council or any other local or county body, but something that's obviously affecting us in a pretty significant way. You see mental health on there, you see poverty, you see uh, uh, obesity related to access to healthy food and opportunities to be able to uh, exercise. You see drug and substance use there, um, uh, and you see some of the other things, again, that show up in our priorities. So what we had in uh, 2018 and 2021 was very similar, and that's not surprising. If it took us decades and generations to get to an unhealthy state, it's going to take um, maybe that amount of time to be able to pull ourselves out of this. And so now what we've prioritized are four major areas of work, and you see that those are the exact same. So we will be focusing on mental health, healthy eating and obesity, substance abuse, and then equitable access, which looks like a lot of different things. So that's what, that's what the CHNA tells us. Lose my clicker here. I did. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So that's the CHNA. That's the Community Health Needs Assessment that was really carried out uh, in uh, uh, August, September, October of 2021. In January of 2022, we as United Way of Greater Topeka carried out a series of stakeholder meetings for a slightly different purpose, not to put together a community health improvement plan, but to listen to the community and prioritize areas for investment and to develop our next evolution as an organization. So how did we do that? We did that through our COVID-19 response and coordination group, which goes out to more than um, 100 emails uh, every week. Uh, had lots of folks participate, a little over 40 participate when we did the uh, when we did the round table in that group. We also uh, called upon our partners at Topeka Housing Authority and they used uh, their connections to be able to connect us to folks across properties um, uh, uh, in the community, not only uh, THA properties, but uh, also Section 8 residents in, 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 in different areas. Brought them together, had some round tables there, learned a lot of really great stuff from them. Then we had a community at large meeting at uh, the a Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library, where we invited the community and put that out to folks and had them participate in roundtables as well. And then uh, we partnered with Lalo and uh, the folks at El Centro and had a roundtable with Spanish-speaking residents. I didn't attend that. Um, I was outside the community. Probably not a good idea for me to be uh, uh, in that particular conversation. I had good dialogue with Lalo. He, he agreed. He ran that entire session, translated, interpreted that entire session, scribed all the notes, and we got some pretty incredible feedback from them. You will be able to see that in these results. So that's what we did to be able to gather what the needs might be in the community. 
And here were some themes. An emphasis on basic needs. This actually came in number one for us. The importance of basic needs. Things like food security, things like housing supports, things like health care and prescription assistance, and safety. Big themes under basic needs. When we coded all of our data from all of our convenings, this one had the highest percentage of responses from folks. Health came in a very close second. That looked like all kinds of different things. That looked like mental health services. That looked like addiction and substance use and misuse. It was really for all ages, children, seniors, and everyone in between, as well as, you see it show up here again, the need for affordable health insurance. So health coming in second for us in terms of those areas that people identified needs across the community. Education was uh, the next area for us that came in. And this looked like all different things. Again, this looked like early education and school readiness for kids. That's obviously where we invest the lion's share of our dollars at United Way, so we were not surprised by that. Um, supports for students once they entered kindergarten through graduation, but also a need for um, more education for adults. That could look like workforce development, skills development, GED. Uh, uh, several of those things were mentioned by folks in the stakeholder meetings that we held uh, in January of this year. Some other themes that were not minor but continue to show up there, language barriers, a need for services and information in Spanish. This, uh, when, we, when we started to drill down into this data a little, uh, a little bit more, it was beyond just having things available in Spanish, but also the importance of uh, greater cultural understanding of cultural differences and of cultural competency of folks across the community. So it's not just enough to take a flyer and to be able to provide it to folks to say, here, please come to this, it's in Spanish. But when folks show up, if everything's in English, and there's no one who speaks Spanish, that's not really access, right? So it's not really getting us all the way there. So I had some really good responses in this way uh, as well from folks. Safety, and in particular, safety in neighborhoods across um, multiple areas uh, in our community, uh, a concern uh, about safety, um, uh, uh, oftentimes related here to mental health issues related to folks who were unsheltered uh, and also uh, substance uh, uh, abuse and addiction. So when we see uh, some of these themes show up on a page like this, for example, they're related to some of those larger themes that we saw earlier in the presentation. Community development showed up there as well. This was related to things like uh, neighborhoods and neighborhood engagement, but also opportunities for youth that were highly localized within neighborhoods. So an opportunity for youth to be able to engage um, in positive behaviors within neighborhoods and within areas where you might have, say, transportation access as a barrier. And then uh, a theme uh, that recurred uh, several times a real concern about our aging population, and in particular here, increasing numbers of unsheltered individuals. So we've had this conversation uh, in a few circles. We've had it in the COVID-19 meeting. We've had it in Homeless Task Force. Uh, there have been some uh, white papers that have been published by some national organizations about the alarmingly high numbers of individuals who uh, are advanced in age, who are inhabiting shelters and who are unsheltered and things like point in time counts. If you looked at it, you know, a few decades ago, you would have seen a lower average or median age among those who were unsheltered. It has been increasing over the years and now is at a level where folks are uh, uh, starting to take, starting to take notice. So uh, looking at uh, access for our aging population uh, was uh, another theme. So across the CHNA, that community health needs assessment, and across the stakeholder meetings that we held, there were some shared themes and some shared issues. Mental health at all ages. So we have strategies and we have work 
uh, related to seniors across our community. We also know based on our conversations with the community, but also with our partners who are in schools, that uh, there is a great need among uh, children in terms of mental health, and then obviously everywhere in between as well. So mental health really rising to the top. Access, um, capacity within organizations, uh, even here related to cultural differences and cultural competencies across the board in our community, just uh, a general need for uh, greater access to mental health services. Following closely behind, not to be confused with, but also related to would be uh, addiction and substance use uh, among individuals in our community and the opportunity for prevention, but also for uh, resiliency and recovery services for folks who uh, are struggling with addiction and substance abuse. Health, which is related to all of this, uh, access to health care and affordable health care. So when we talk about affordable health care, we talk about things like uh, Medicaid, obviously something outside of our control in terms of expansion, but also folks talking about rising uh, insurance premiums, even on places like the marketplace but also access to healthcare. And access to healthcare can look like a lot of different things. It can look like geography. It can look like saying, I don't have particular services within my neighborhood. It can look like transportation. So with seniors, for example, may look like uh, need for uh, increased uh, medical transportation opportunities. But access to healthcare can also look like uh, language barriers, cultural barriers, um, uh, other systems barriers that folks run into when they are trying to access health health care for themselves, for their loved ones, for their uh, families. And finally, equitable access. I just threw all of this together because it's, it's, it's an area that touches so many of these things, but is key. You see language here again. You see transportation, something we talk about pretty often. Uh, poverty, uh, we could include things like race and ethnicity in here uh, as well again, when we're talking about equitable access to services. So when we look at, you know, uh, more than, uh, you know, 4,000 responses across our community regarding the needs, uh, these are the four areas that emerge. And interestingly enough, these very much align with our community health improvement plan that we hope to have uh, published in early October. Uh, it reflects where we've been, uh, it reflects where we are, and it reflects where we are going. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, I did take a look at the 2023 uh, Social Services Grant awardees to be able to see where they fit in this particular area. And there are some things to note. Just based on a cursory look uh, over this list, uh, at least four of these focus on uh, equitable access to services, particularly for seniors. Uh, four of these uh, are related to uh, supports and equitable access in terms of education for families. Around four of those focus on school age education equity. One of the programs uh, focuses on uh, language access and equity. Three of them focus on mental behavioral health. Three of them focus on health and access to health care. Three of them are connected to equitable access in terms of housing and housing supports. And then one of them is very much a wraparound service, which again would fall into equitable access to services uh, as well. So when we take a look at where we're going in terms of investment of these, uh, these dollars through the social services grants uh, for this upcoming year, we very much align with what the community has identified as the needs, where our community health improvement plan will be focused over the next three years, and where our current community health improvement plan uh, has focused for the last couple of years. So that's the presentation today, uh, taking a look at all of those data points 
I wonder if you might have some questions related to the presentation today. Let's open that up to committee members first, but we can also open up for questions from our guests, um, even and staff as far as that goes. Anybody? But give a com committee members. Councilman Nager. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for this presentation. Not a question, more of a comment. I'm, I am encouraged to see that it does appear that all of our organizations are pretty much on the same page as far as what this community needs. And this is the same sort of, these are the same sorts of issues that are coming to organizations like um, the Topeka Partnership and the city council members um, individually. So it is nice to know that we're all getting the same sort of information, that we're all in alignment on the needs of our community and that we are seeing through the social service grants. And I know that these are also being reflected in the American Rescue um, Plan Act um, grant process that we're all working to solving these issues in our community. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilman Kell, anything to ask or add at this point? Not sure I even see him. Anybody else with questions or comments at this point? For our committee, I think it will be helpful. I really appreciate, um, on, on behalf of all of us, this rundown. It's very informative, uh, for the most part, very affirming. Um, are there, maybe before I make the comment about our planning for next year, you didn't really identify anything as you went through here as new or emerging in, in either these conversations or ones that you've had since. Are there any emerging needs, and if so, or emerging um, movements to address some of these needs that would be good for us to refresh on? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think, um, I think in the conversations that I'm seeing at the local level, but also uh, at regional, state, and even national levels, uh, the Particular areas are not changing, but the ways we're talking about them and the nuance within them, I think, is different. So I would say where it is emerging in these conversations is related to language and cultural barriers. Conversations there that I haven't seen in you know, just my short time uh, seven years, six and a half years at United Way, I haven't seen the conversations related to language access quite like they're happening right now. They are related to equity. They're related to justice uh, in, many, uh, uh, in many of these circumstances. And the ways in which uh, some communities are uh, attacking that uh, problem are, um, are exemplary. Uh, I, think, I think there's some real opportunity to learn from some of our uh, peer communities across uh, the United States about how this works. I'll give you an example from the panel I was on on health equity on Monday. I learned of a, a, a hospital system in the Northeast, um, more than 75% of the population Spanish speaking in this community. And what they have done in healthcare in particular is they have been very intentional about an internship, a paid internship program for high school students who are able to come into the hospital, who are able to partner with folks and shadow to be able to uh, learn more about uh, healthcare within their community. And then uh, many of them are going on to school, but some of them are coming directly back to the hospital when they graduate. And the beautiful thing about the way they've put this program together is if a student starts in September in the internship, interns for an entire year, and then in June starts work with the hospital full-time, their start date is retroactive to September so that they've almost got a year within this healthcare system. As I listen to them talk about how they've implemented this and the way they've built equity into it, I'm very interested to see in 10 or 15 years what the face of that hospital system looks like through an intentional approach to internships in that way. My guess is 
that you will find uh, exponentially higher numbers of providers and staff within that hospital system that begin to reflect the community that they serve. And I think that is significant. I think what you will see from that is certainly what the research tells us and what the data tells us is that when you do that, you will see health disparities narrow. You will see health outcomes increase. You will see um, uh, folks connecting with their primary care physicians more and being able to get the access to services that they need. That's just one example, but that's a really bold way that um, three or four or five years ago when we were talking about health equity, there weren't those kinds of bold moves in communities to be able to do that. And that's, that's, um, that's, a, that's just one example of the way in which some communities are approaching language and cultural barrier issues. They also have a whole host of things related to that um, and, and, and how it is that, that, um, that the interns who come in have supports all along the way. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a pretty robust uh, uh, program. Uh, I've connected with her and hope to learn more about it. But that's just one example of ways in which I think the language conversation is different than it was five, 10, even 15 years ago. So. The other area I would say that this is related to is related to race. Um, we have talked a lot in our communities about uh, uh, racial and ethnic disparities in health outcomes. <sighs> what I'm noticing in the conversations is a, a greater sense of urgency. So not just talking about the issues, not just identifying this, them in this way, not just disaggregating the data related to race and ethnicity, but actually talking about um, the importance of um, culturally competent uh, services across our community, but also beginning to identify and recognize things like systemic and institutional racism and implicit bias and how it is that um, just talking about it uh, uh, isn't, isn't enough, identifying it isn't enough, but actually looking at a systems level, at an institutional level, and at a personal level on how it is that we can begin to understand what those barriers, microaggressions look like for people of color in particular. And that's just a different conversation, I think, than was, than, than was happening three or four years ago as well. So those are two big ones when I think about this. Thank you for that. I'll take this moment since our city manager has joined us and he has introduced that internship con concept with great success already and has talked about doing much more of that in this case in our city government. But um, if we all understand those models and those um, daring moves forward, it, it will help further. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, Chair, if I could um, actually even want to expand one step farther. So Mr. Martin, the uh, program that you were referring to, um, happy to share that um, uh, our chief of staff, former inter interim city manager, uh, has, is working on a program right now, a very similar type of program. Mm -hmm. um, we're deep into some conversations to where we, we would be able to expand that throughout the city um, and hopefully provide some, some wonderful opportunities to some young adults uh, to where when they do get out of high school, they've got ready-made employment set to go. So that's great. Uh, we're, we're working deep on that. Thanks to Bill. Well, thank you for that. And, and t tying back to social services and the subject at hand in, in ways you don't always start right in the lane, right? <coughs> so if, if various of us are doing those kinds of bold and needed moves, in city government or whatever, we can all contribute to that um, new normal um, in terms of community change. Chair? Absolutely. Yes. Um, thank you. I'm very, very excited to hear that that conversation has really shifted. Being in healthcare, I can definitely speak towards that we need to make these shifts as a community, all of us, really challenging how we see the world now challenging those implicit biases and realizing that right now they're holding us back, but they don't need to any longer if we go ahead and address them. And I think that also really ties in very nicely looking at internship programs like this um, empowering our youth in the community to build for a better tomorrow that is integral to 
the um, purposes of the Momentum 2022 and now the Momentum 2027 work that's being done by the partnership. And so to see that this is being enacted in multiple um, in city government, um, in our private sector, and especially in the healthcare community, I hope that the healthcare community picks that up because we need to be able to better address a lot of these issues that start off as small little microaggressions and then blow up into full-blown um, racial and socioeconomic disparities. So I really appreciate you bringing that to the forefront. And um, I absolutely appreciate that the work that, um, and Mr. Cochran, your title has gotten so long now. Um, but thank you for all of the work that you're doing on that front. And thank you to our new city manager for making sure that that is something that we are pushing forward. Um, like I said, it's something that we all need to be focused on. And so I encourage those who are watching this and other, not just leaders in the community, but just community members in general, to make sure that we're all working together on this as a team to make this less of an issue in our community. Thank you so much. Other comments, questions, contributions? If not, we will, uh, are you sure? We've, we've got some time here. Our next step as a committee then is to um, keep this, it's not all new, but this progression of information in mind when we look at, uh, at our next couple of meetings this fall to look again at our list of priorities for what we are funding with the city social service grant dollars and um, make our recommendations to the governing body both on the priorities as well as the process. Um, that's what we do in the fall. But this has been really valuable. Thank you so much for the work that you've done and, and everyone that's on this meeting or call because many people here have been involved in that process and it, it makes a difference. And it is exciting to hear how well um, you've broadened that process for input as well as how many people are already on board. Something that I personally have been, every once in a while it's been fractured, but overall, something I'm really proud of about choosing to live here and stay here is how well this community shares a common, common vision, a common goal, and how well people work together. So, appreciate that. Uh, I can give just a quick update, otherwise related okay. to the timeline and sort of where we are here. So, um, okay. I met with my team this morning. Uh, we should have contracts. Uh, for the 2023 year coming out in mid-October. They will come out after the 15th uh, because the 15th is when the third quarter reports are due for 22. And in order to keep traffic with our partners <laughs> and communication and all that, we'll let them complete those third quarter reports. But all of those contracts are set to go out uh, October 17th. So those will be moving out. So uh, that's good. That is general fund contracts. Those will all be ready. So uh, moving uh, in uh, that direction, and then those uh, third quarter reports for uh, the current year are scheduled to go out uh, October 1st. Just to give you a sense of how much progress we've made in our relationship with the city of Topeka and just in this whole process, the first year, the contracts went out in April. And <laughs> that's, it's six months earlier, and it's a month earlier than it was last year. So we're slowly sort of getting to, um, uh, uh, getting to a, a, a good place here and um, having good communication with and support from uh, city staff has been key. So especially uh, thanks to Carrie and to Corey for all the support that they've given us as vendors. Um, continues to work well and I look forward to this next year. So thanks. Thank you so much. And if there are any viewers who are watching who don't know, United Way is our contracted vendor to handle the application as well as the grant administration process for our social service grants from the city and their contract. You got a three-year contract this mm -hmm. time? Okay, so they're on board for the, for the ride here. For sure. Thank you so much. Great. Anything else? With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>